Joining us now for further discussion on this strike is Pete Sepp. He's president of the National Taxpayers Union. Pete, thanks for joining us. I want to start with this. Now, we just heard what our White House correspondent Jack Bradley said there about what the Biden administration is doing. It says it won't get involved in the strike. But it does have the power to invoke the Taft-Hartley Act, which would force these striking workers to return to work for 80 days. Are you recommending that the government do that? The government should definitely consider doing so the longer this strike goes on. We have to compare and contrast what's going on here economically with the freight rail strike that was threatened back in 2022. At that time, the Biden administration and Congress intervened with legislation, basically saying to the railroad unions, you need to accept the contract that's been negotiated. Well, the consequences of a rail strike were estimated at about $2 billion of economic costs each day. The port strike is estimated at $5 billion. Uh, When we do the math, we realize that the port strike has even greater gravity for the economy, especially given Helene tearing through the United States and other economic problems that could arise because of the wars in the Middle East. There is an urgency to this strike that is even greater than the rail strike. The administration intervened back then. It needs to do more now. Certainly a lot happening right now. And let's talk a little bit about these demands they have now. Apart from that pay raise that they want, the other main demand from these strikers is banning automation. We've seen technology take over many jobs in many sectors all across the country already. So do you see some sort of feasible middle ground for workers and employers to reach on this subject? Well, there have already been suggestions from labor and infrastructure experts to say, well, How about we come up with a plan that maintains good compensation, even increases it for port workers, and helps them to transition into other types of jobs? Halting automation is probably the worst possible and most damaging demand that the workers are making here. It's not even the compensation increases. When you think about it, U.S. ports are at the bottom in many cases, the dead bottom of the World Bank's list of ports around the world that are economically efficient, capable of handling and moving large volumes of freight. The federal government gave $17 billion worth of grants in the last $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill to modernize ports. If the union demands are acceded to and we're not going to have port modernization, taxpayers deserve a refund of that money. It's one reason my organization is so concerned with this matter. Now, I want to talk about this. When America lost its manufacturing base to China, there were some analysts that blamed the government for not putting any sort of protectionist measures or enough of these measures in place to prevent it. But then we have the other side as well saying that this is simply, you know, the free market at work. So taking this into consideration, do the longshoremen not have any reason to worry about the free market coming for their jobs? No, in fact, they should be worried about government protectionist measures making their jobs even less and less relevant. All of these laws that have been passed some 100 years ago to protect U.S. maritime interests requiring U.S. crews on U.S. flagged ships that are U.S. built and U.S. owned creates shortages in shipping and creates all kinds of economic inefficiencies that are making it more and more difficult for their jobs to exist. Meanwhile, things like export-dependent jobs Uh, Imagine, for example, the plants in South Carolina that make cars and send them overseas. They can't move their goods right now. What about those workers and the families they have to feed? Uh, That's not really being taken into account, at least not sufficiently right now, in the minds of policymakers. Pete, I want to talk a little more about these stalled imports and exports that you just mentioned there. We are seeing dozens of these large cargo ships kind of just anchored at these ports right now because they can't bring things in or take things out. How much do you see this strike costing businesses that depend on these stalled imports and exports? We won't know the true costs until, hopefully, the strike is settled soon. But you will begin to see pretty severe shortages of certain goods 
occurring within the next few weeks, and that will have ripple effects. Uh, imagine, for example, food shortages uh, that might affect restaurant prices. Customers may not want to go there anymore, and low-wage restaurant workers might get their hours cut back. They might even get laid off. So the so-called knock-on effects and the recent cost estimates of $5 billion a day could actually get worse, especially in the energy area. If we have to start transporting a lot of goods from the West Coast ports that are open all the way to the East Coast, you know, we were kind of counting on a drop in gasoline prices that normally happens in the fall of every year due to a lot of technical factors that may not happen this time around. And the strike would have a lot to blame. Pete, your answer flows perfectly into my next question. I want to ask more about these shortages. Now, companies, some did preemptively bring in some earlier shipments to mitigate the effects of this strike that they had seen coming. But how long before that runs out and consumers start seeing this impact? I mean, both on the grocery shelves and for their wallets. I would think that by the end of this month, without a strike settlement, there will be some effects being felt by consumers, not only shortages, but higher prices. And of course, even if the strike is settled by, say, Halloween, there are going to be many, many ripple effects that will go all the way into the holiday season. It might not be a very Merry Christmas or even a Happy Thanksgiving for a lot of American families. That really is concerning. Elaborate a little more. What kind of ripple effects is the economy going to see? Well, you will certainly see problems in exporting industries. That's often overlooked here. We think about consumers in our country, but all of the goods that we export right now that go on ships are going to be delayed severely getting to markets abroad. That will cut into profits of U.S. companies that are export dependent. So you may very well see fewer tax revenues being reported from these companies owing to fourth quarter losses. Again, the energy price problems could rear their ugly heads. You could also see worker layoffs or reduced hours in industries that depend on the goods that are no longer making it to the East Coast. It's also conceivable that you're going to see difficulty in storm recovery efforts. You know, many types of materials that aren't on the military's list or mission critical lists are going to come in short supply. And governments themselves, funded by taxpayers, are going to have shortages too. Think about school lunches, for example. Uh, the prices of providing those might actually go up here on the East Coast. That's going to affect taxpayers at the local level. So how do you see this strike being resolved? Very clearly, we need to think about the long-term impact of restricting automation at U.S. ports. We need to make sure that we don't turn back the clock even further because U.S. ports are already way behind many others in terms of their efficiency. Make sure that if we need to focus on the compensation for the workers, do that, but do it quickly and don't restrict our options for making these ports more efficient in the future. All right, Pete, very quickly before we go here, we're just a month away from this presidential election. Do you see that having any sort of impact on this strike or vice versa? Yeah, some have said that maybe the union vote is up for grabs here, and that's why there hasn't been action on the part of the administration. I think as time goes on, that's going to become less of a factor, and consumer dissatisfaction and other workers who are dependent on exports and imported materials are going to get angry about this, and the political factor may boomerang. All right, Pete Sepp, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure.